Well, welcome to another Friday night. We've been working through a series called A Deeper Look at the 60 Characteristics of Complex Trauma. So we're taking each of the characteristics and doing a deep dive on really exploring them and understanding them and looking at healing and what that means for people in, with complex trauma. And today we come to impulsive. And it's again a very common thing that happens with people with complex trauma. And I want to under, help you understand why. I want you to think about kind of the results of being this way in your adult life and then how to change and become more healthy. So let's begin with a definition. Basically, it's acting before you think or acting without thinking about long-term consequences. So you only think about the instant gratification you're going to get from this activity and you don't think beyond that instant gratification. So another way to say that is impulsiveness is basically making decisions from your limbic brain, from the emotional part of your brain, from the child part of your brain. It's making decisions that are based on emotions rather than careful thinking, the cortex part of your brain. So uh, a definition in a dictionary is impulsive is motivated by emotion rather than thought. Spontaneous actions based on desires, whims, and inclinations. So another way to say it is people who are impulsive have poor impulse control. They have poor natural inhibition. Another way to look at it, and this one I find quite helpful for people, is impulsive people tend to follow a cycle. So they act without thinking, do stuff that they then regret, so they then go to guilt, and then they obsess about what they did. So in other words, they don't think about it beforehand, but afterwards, they think about it nonstop. They obsess. And so the goal is, let's start thinking beforehand and not afterwards, because if we wait to afterwards, we're going to do tons of thinking, but it's not changing anything. So Roger Zelazny said, I have always been impulsive. My thinking is usually pretty good, but I always seem to do it after I do my talking by which time I've generally destroyed all basis for further conversation. The damage has been done by then. You can analyze it all you want, but the damage has been done. You should have done the thinking beforehand. This is a cute definition. Impulsivity is something akin to spontaneously jumping out of an airplane and not realizing that you forgot something until you're five seconds before impact. Somebody else said, most of the problems in life are because of two reasons. We act without thinking, or we keep thinking without acting. And I thought that is especially applicable to people from complex trauma. Now, I need to make a distinction for you here between impulsivity and spontaneity. The two are similar. They sound the same. Both impulsivity and spontaneity are about unplanned actions, acting on impulses. But there is a difference. So impulsivity is always put in a negative context. Because it's doing this action impulsively without thinking about it and always ending up hurting yourself or hurting others. So there's always going to be the net result of somebody will get hurt by this action without thinking. Spontaneity, on the other hand, looks like impulsivity because you do something spontaneously, but, but the difference is... Before you do it, there's that slight moment in the cortex that looks at the big picture to weigh out in just a nanosecond the outcome in light of the big picture of what's going on. So if you didn't take that moment 
to look at the big picture, to quickly weigh out the consequences long term, then it would no longer be a healthy spontaneity. It would go into impulsive behavior. So spontaneous looks like it's impulsive, but there is thinking going on. And it is thinking in light of a picture and consequences. Impulsivity is only thinking about instant gratification. So let me give you some examples. And <clears throat> you can see just kind of different areas where impulsivity shows up in people's lives and causes problems. And some of these you will have in your own life. So the first is impulsivity around anger. So a person is very angry. And when they're very angry, they're very prone to be impulsive. And it's not a good thing. So the first is physical violence. So they are angry and all of a sudden now they're acting out in hitting so something um, impulsively. They, they're not thinking, they're just acting and they can do a lot of damage. Someone goes further when they're angry. They then throw things and break things and hit things. They destroy property. All in an impulsive moment they decide to do that. Others when they're angry they could have a little wee problem that they should probably just be patient with and, and not really deal with because it'll take care of itself. But when they're angry, they impulsively jump on something and make it worse. They escalate problems from molehills into mountains and make it a big deal for everybody. Others, when they're angry, they lack filters. So they're there's a whole bunch of things that they wouldn't normally say to people when they're calm. They got all these filters of respect, of thoughtfulness. But when they're angry, filters get taken away and they lash out with things that they say that are very hurtful. Or it can also show just their inability to control anger. So the slightest anger and they lose control and they impulsively act. So they're not able to control that anger impulse when it hits them. So many of you can relate to that. It's a huge issue. For some, when they're angry or depressed or anxious, they impulsively self-harm. Cut, burn, all of those types of things. Now let's go a little different direction. Some people, they binge impulsively. They they just start eating. They don't think about it. They just start eating. They go shopping. They gamble. They feel bored. They feel antsy. They have the slightest emotion that's uncomfortable. <clears throat> and they impulsively medicate it with food or activities. Others you'll see impulsivity, impulsivity where they've got a bunch of projects on the go. But they see a new project and they impulsively take on that project and drop a whole bunch of other projects. And then they start on that new project and then they see another thing and they impulsively jump to that thing and drop what they're doing. So that they end up not finishing very many things in their life. They keep quitting a whole bunch of things because a new, better opportunity came up or more exciting opportunity came up. Some people have impulsivity around sex. So they engage in sex without protection. They, they engage in sex in ways that they regret. And then some have impulsivity when it comes to sharing with others. So all of a sudden they are feeling close to a person and they overshare. They share things they should never share, but they can't stop that impulse in that moment when they're feeling really close to somebody. So those are just some examples of impulsivity. I found it interesting that there's actually a test that they give now called the buying impulsiveness scale. And I'm not going to give you the whole test. I'm going to give you the four kind of main questions that the test is built around to see if there's some buying impulsivity in you. So the answers are true or false. So Number one, I often buy things without thinking. Two, I buy things according to 
to how I'm feeling at the moment. Three, I carefully plan most of my purchases. And four, sometimes I'm a little reckless about what I buy. And there's about 20 questions that come at those from just different wording to test whether a person has issues when it comes to shopping, where they could be impulsive very easily. So that leads to a very important question. Why are people impulsive? So I want to give you just the scientific part first, and then we'll go into the complex trauma part. So scientifically, impulse comes out of the limbic brain. Again, the child brain. So a child, when they see something they like, they just want it now. Instant gratification. They don't think long term. And so the child brain is always impulsive. And if it's in a good mood, then they just want to tease others, bug others, whatever. They don't think because of their emotional state. They just want to act on it. So that's you have to keep in mind because we're going to come back to that. <clears throat> we're going to come back to the limbic brain part. But there's a second thing is the design of the brain is the child brain. The limbic brain is this little emotion impulse center. But then the cortex is built around it and it's the manager. And it manages impulse. And so if there's damage to the cortex then people have impulse control issues. So somebody who's had a stroke often will lose inhibitions. They'll lose their ability to control their impulses. A child with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder can have damage to the cortex, which makes it very difficult for them to control impulses. Meth damages the cortex so that a person has great difficulty with impulse control. Now with meth, meth, some of the cortex can heal, but what I'm seeing and watching the meth that people are using today is that often there's some permanent damage in the cortex which causes them to have ongoing issues around impulse control. When people are drinking or using drugs, that affects the cortex and inhibits impulse control. And so they're more likely to do silly things that they'll regret later because in that moment, they're not able to control their impulses very well. Some mental health issues affect the ability to control impulse control. Bipolar disorder for one, borderline personality disorder when a person is triggered is another one that greatly inhibits impulse control. It's important to understand chemically in the brain that whenever cortisol is released, so when you're angry, stressed, depressed, feeling overwhelmed, cortisol causes the cortex to shut down. Therefore, it inhibits impulse control. And the reason it does it is the reason you have cortisol is, the, is when there's danger, fear, so, or you're angry. And so cortisol gives you energy to fight or flight. And it shuts down the cortex because it says, we don't have time to think right now. We are in survival mode. We need to act. And so anytime there's cortisol, there's it inhibits impulse control. And then I think beyond all of that, culturally, if you look at our culture today, we live in a world with tons of advertising, but now we can buy online. We can buy on our phone. We can buy and just say, oh, that looks good, push a button, and, and you've ordered it. And so it becomes very, very easy in our culture to buy impulsively. And our culture is actually set up to try and encourage people to do it. And so this whole impulsive shopping thing, I think is only going to get worse and worse 
over the next years because of online buying. Now let me bring it to the complex trauma component. Why is it that people from complex trauma especially struggle with being impulsive? So let's go back to the limbic brain. When you're in complex trauma, you're in ongoing danger, which means you're in ongoing limbic mode. So the limbic brain becomes the control center of the brain. It's used all the time. The cortex doesn't get a chance to develop properly. It doesn't become the manager of the limbic brain. The limbic brain is in the driver's seat. And so what happens then when a person comes to adult life, their limbic brain is overdeveloped, their cortex is underdeveloped. And so anything that triggers the limbic brain, which means anything that causes strong emotions, puts a person back into the limbic brain, is in the driver's seat, and that makes them impulsive. So just think of it. When a person is angry, the limbic brain is fired up, more impulsive than when they're not angry. When a person is depressed, more impulsive. When they're stressed or overwhelmed, when they're filled with anxiety, boredom, frustration, grief, all of those things trigger the limbic brain and it makes them more impulsive. So any strong emotion, and I need to add with complex trauma, even good emotions which trigger the limbic brain can result in impulsive behavior, but it's impulsive negative behavior. Behavior that has negative consequences. So a dangerous time for a lot of people is when they're feeling really good because they become quite impulsive and that can lead to old behaviors. Another factor with that is one of the things that helps the cortex manage the limbic brain is my emotional and physical health and energy. So if my physical gas tank is full and I'm well-rested and energetic, if my emotional gas tank is full and I'm in a good head space, I am able to manage my limbic brain much easier. But if I'm exhausted, if I'm stressed out, if I'm depressed, I have less strength to manage my limbic brain, which makes me more vulnerable to become impulsive. Other parts of complex trauma that affect this impulsiveness thing. Most people from complex trauma do not grow up with healthy boundaries. And that means internal boundaries. They're not good at sticking to a routine. They're not good with structure. They're not good at forcing themselves to do things they don't feel like doing. And so because of that, They don't have good internal boundaries today. And good internal boundaries are what control whether I follow an impulse or not. The next thing is some people out of complex trauma were spoiled children. Their parents gave them whatever they wanted. The parents didn't say no to them. And so if the child had an impulsive desire, the parents would give into them. They wouldn't provide a boundary for that child. And so spoiled children, once they become adults, have great difficulty saying no to their impulses because nobody's ever done that to them. Also, you can have children who are very controlled. And what happens within that is as soon as they get an opportunity to make a decision for themselves, they grab it. And they become impulsive when they get the slightest opening to do something that they want. So controlling parents can create impulsive children because the children are just trying to make the odd decision for themselves. And then children who are controlled and feel that life is very unfair for them and their needs aren't being met can rebel. And that rebellion can often show up in becoming impulsive. Just doing quickly what parents don't want me to do just to rebel 
against the system. Next one is children from complex trauma have all of this unresolved emotional pain and anger. And it just is there all the time. And they can't get rid of it. So one of the things they look for is grab anything that will give pleasure. That will take the pain away for a little while. So they impulsively grab pleasure every opportunity they get to try to have some pleasant emotions in their life. Others are impulsive because they've become addicted to chaos. And so they do impulsive things because it creates chaos. Now I need to add that this can happen at a subconscious level. They may not even be aware that they create chaos by being impulsive, but they do. And then some are drawn in their addiction to chaos. They're drawn to risky behaviors. Because that gets the adrenaline running. And that makes them feel alive. And so they may impulsively choose to do risky things. Driving and other activities. And again, it can be a very subconscious thing. Now let me just end with this part about complex trauma. Not everybody with complex trauma becomes impulsive. Many do, but some go to the other extreme and become hyper self-controlled. So they never have a hair out of place. They never do anything impulsively. They pride themselves on their self-control, their self-discipline, but they've got the same trauma. They're just responding at the other end of the spectrum. Now, in case you haven't thought about it or figured it out, which I'm pretty sure you have, I just want to just very briefly say, is impulsivity good or bad? Hopefully you you can stop minimizing, oh, it doesn't hurt anybody, that kind of thinking, or I love it, it, it makes me who I am, and really begin to be honest about the fact that impulsive behavior is always doing things that ultimately hurt you or others. It always leads to regret. It can lead to great damage. And then if you're impulsively shopping, before you know it, you've got this debt that adds extra stress. Or if you're an impulsive binge eater, you keep putting on weight. So it doesn't matter what it is that you impulsively do, If you play the tape out to the end, you will always see it does damage to yourself and others. And that means short-term pleasure, long-term pain, long-term damage. And then out of that, it increases conflict in relationships. Your partner is mad at the mounting debt. And then... It feeds deeper shame and guilt inside of yourself because you keep doing those things and you know you shouldn't. And then that increases your anxiety and your depression. And so it starts snowballing into a bigger and bigger issue. So you can minimize it if you want. But if you honestly look at long-term consequences, I hope you'll see I don't want to go down that road. It's not worth it. Short-term good feelings aren't going to be worth the long-term pain and damage that it will do. Heraclitus said this, It is hard to fight against impulsive desire. But then he said this, Whatever impulsive desire wants, it will buy at the cost of the soul. It will hurt you deep inside. It will cost you greatly. So what's involved in healing? And I want to make this very practical. So we got to start with the goal in getting healthy, the goal in growing up, the goal in recovery is that your cortex manages your limbic brain. And so continue to work on strengthening your cortex. 
if you feel yourself go into your limbic brain, de-escalate out of there. Get back into your cortex so that decisions are made from your cortex, not from your limbic brain. That's the big picture of what we're trying to do. Okay, so let's say that you impulsively eat or impulsively shop. Make yourself accountable to somebody. And I've had people that say, I'm not going to eat anything more today. And I want you to know about it. And I want you to ask me about it tomorrow, how I did. That a little bit of accountability just helps them to say no to the impulses that will come throughout the evening. I've had other clients who've given their credit cards and their bank card, debit card, checkbook to loved ones so that they don't feel or they, they don't have the opportunity to give into being impulsive in spending. And so basically what you're doing is putting up roadblocks, obstacles that the, it's going to be very hard for your, you to get past when you're feeling impulsive. One of the things that I've always done in my life that I'm so thankful for is whenever it comes to a, a significant purchase of something or a significant change and I get the thought, I don't act on it for a day. I just leave it. And many, many times the next day, I go, whew, I'm glad I didn't act on it yesterday. I would have regretted it. When, another thing that you can do is when you're going, let's say, to the mall or you're going to the grocery store, mentally prepare yourself in advance for the possible temptations you'll face, the possible scenarios you'll encounter and talk yourself through how you're going to respond so that it's not like you're getting blindsided when you get there. And then be aware of times in the year or the day when you are most vulnerable. So some people do great with impulse control in the morning, but at night when they're tired, it's terrible. Other people on anniversaries or weekends or special holidays, that's when their impulse control is the worst. So you need to be aware of yourself and when you are most vulnerable. Another time that many people are, vul are vulnerable is when they're with their friend who's extremely impulsive. And when they spend time with that, that friend, they become impulsive too, and, and they just kind of click together, and it just makes things worse. So you may need some boundaries around spending time with certain people because you just can't say no when they go into impulsive mode. Another thing is plan your day, plan your evening so that you have, this is what I'm going to do. So you don't have a whole bunch of free time on your hand going, now what should I do? Oh, okay, impulsive. Plan your days. Another very wise advice is don't make any major decisions after a significant loss. So after a significant loss, don't go out and buy something brand new or jump into another relationship impulsively. That you may have lots of regrets about. And so what you're doing in your limbic brain cortex relationship is if you feel yourself triggered and you feel that impulse, impulsive thing happening, de-escalate, get into your cortex, and what you do in the cortex is Play the tape out to the end. Because all the limbic brain's been focused on is instant gratification. So you want to get out of that into your cortex, play the tape out to the end, and follow the cortex. Another thing that you might ver find very helpful is mindfulness. So when you experience an impulsive reflex, Stop and go, I wonder what's going on here. Why am I feeling impulsive today? And know your normal pattern. So am I bored? Oh, yeah. Am I feeling discontent? Am I angry? Am I stressed? Am I feeling overwhelmed? Oh, okay, that's what's going on here. Then you can focus on 
dealing with what's underneath the impulse, impulsive tendencies. And a final thing is, in recovery, in adult life, healthy people are consistent people. And what that means is a healthy parent is a person who doesn't just be a good dad on the days he feels like being a good dad. He's a good dad every day, whether he feels like it or not. He's consistent. He's not acting out of his limbic brain. He's saying, here's what my kids need every day. And so if my limbic brain doesn't feel like it, too bad, I'm still going to do it. I'm going to live out of my cortex. And so that translates into all of life. I want to consistently do what is healthy and loving, whether I feel like it or not. That becomes the way forward. Now let me just end with some quotes that I came across that I found very helpful when it comes to this whole thing of being impulsive. So Norman Vincent Peale said, the cyclone derives its power from a calm center. So does a person. So an impulsive person is always bouncing around. There's unrest in their center. There's not peace in their center. And so you need to work towards peace at your core, calmness. Another one, a Chinese proverb. If you are patient or have self-control in one moment of anger, you will avoid 100, 100 years of sorrow. In other words, if you give in to that one moment of anger, you're going to have 100 years of regrets. But if you learn to stop that impulse, it's going to spare you 100 years of sorrow. Another one, no one can think clearly when they're Fists are clenched. In other words, when you're angry, you have cortisol in the brain, it shuts down your cortex, and you do not think clearly. Another one, don't make a permanent decision for your temporary emotion. Vincent van Gogh said, great things are not done by impulse, but by a series of small things brought together. Great things happen by consistently doing the little things. Aristotle said it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. So you can feel an impulse. You can think about the impulse, but it doesn't mean you have to do it. And then finally, the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Getting into your cortex. I hope you see the importance of this topic. It's not just kind of a minor little thing, especially when you have children and you're in intimate relationships. And I hope you've just received some healthy tools for this. So that's the end of part one. I'm going to take a very short break and I'll come back for part two, which is a Christian part. If you're not interested in that, not a problem. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in a minute. Well, welcome back. We're looking at the life of Peter, and today we come to Peter's main thing he's known for, and that's he was an impulsive guy, and it ties in with what we were just talking about. And so Peter, we repeatedly see doing these very impulsive things, and so this one that he does in the story today is probably his worst 
And so let me set the stage again. We're looking at the time of Jesus just before he died. So he's had the Passover celebration with his disciples. Then they went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus wanted to pray. And he's prayed and and now he's come back to the disciples and they've been sleeping. It's really late. And then the following happens. After these sayings, Jesus crossed the Kedron Valley with his disciples, entered in to a grove of olive trees. So that's the Garden of Gethsemane. <clears throat> then it says this, Judas the betrayer knew this place. So Judas hadn't gone with Jesus. He had taken off in the middle of the Passover feast to go and tell the religious leaders, I can take you to Jesus now. I know where he is so you can arrest him. And so the leading priests and the Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards, so Jewish and Roman soldiers, so probably 600 to 1,000 people to accompany him into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrive at the Olive Grove. Jesus steps forward to meet them. And he says, ask, who are you looking for? They replied, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus said, I am he. And as soon as he said that, they all drew back and fell to the ground. So you can see all these thousand people just falling backwards. So they all get back up and Jesus says again, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus the Nazarene. And he says, I told you that I am he. And since I'm the one you want, and you've spelled that out very clearly, let these other 11 men go. So Jesus is working to make very clear that they only want him, and they're not going to arrest his disciples, and he's going to let them go. That was his intent. But at that moment, Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. Now I imagine he's swinging for his head and the guy ducks and he gets his ear. What an impulsive thing. A thousand probably soldiers there with weapons. Peter with a group of Jesus and the 11 disciples pulls out a sword and starts swinging it. What a disaster waiting to happen. But Jesus quickly jumps in and says to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering my Father has given me? What an amazing scene. Now you have to understand, again, at Passover, the city of Jerusalem swelled in size to three times its normal size. Rome was on pins and needles because this was the time when people would revolt. There would be all kinds of riots. And so the soldiers are just ready at the slightest thing to jump in and stop it before it blows up. And so what could have very easily happened in this experience where Peter impulsively swings his sword is all these soldiers could have just jumped. And they could have killed Jesus and the, all of the disciples. And that would have totally messed up God's plan. Because Jesus was to die the next day, not the day before. And that would have just thrown everything off. It would have been a bloodbath. You can just imagine how this could have gone wrong so easily. And so Peter's one impulsive act. And so I ask myself, what is going on here? Why does Peter do that? Where's his brain at that he would start swinging his sword when they're clearly a very small mi minority? They don't have a chance of winning. What is he thinking? Well, we can't be sure because we're not told. But I, I can think of kind of three possibilities. So the first thing is, Jesus asked this group of people, who are you looking for? 
They say Jesus of Nazarene, he says, I am. Now, I am is the Jewish word Yahweh for God. And so what many think is that Jesus is saying, I am. He says, Yahweh, I'm God. And the power of his word knocks over a thousand strong soldiers. And so what Peter might have been thinking is, wow, Jesus can win this battle against all these soldiers with a word. That's how powerful he is. We don't have a stand, stand a chance of losing. So out comes my sword and I'm going to join Jesus and help out. That could be what he is thinking. Or Jesus has just said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter has vowed he never would and that he loved Jesus more than anybody else, more than the other disciples. And so maybe he sees this as an opportunity to show his loyalty to Jesus. Jesus, they're coming to arrest you. I'm going to come and stand by your side and fight for you. And he does that, could be impulsively. Or maybe he sees Judas, the one who was a follower of Jesus, a friend for over three years, and he sees him come and betray Jesus to the authorities to have him killed. And maybe this surge of anger at Judas, at what was going on, took over and he impulsively acts. We don't know. But it happened. And I want you to see what Jesus' response was. Jesus quickly tells Peter to put away. He takes charge of the situation. Put your sword away. He reaches down and grabs the ear and puts it back on Malchus and heals it. So it's like major, quick damage control. But two things are going to be happening with that. Number one, Jesus is taking this very negative situation and turning it into a positive. Because what the Roman authorities and Jew authorities would love is if Jesus comes out fighting. Because now they can say, see, he was trying to overthrow Israel. But what he does is he shows by stopping Peter, by healing the ear, that he's not planning a revolt. That's not what he's about. He's not in this in a political way. So they have nothing to fear he is making in that act very clear who he is and what he's about. And it's not something they need to be afraid of. He is putting his character on display. He is about loving people, not about trying to overthrow people. So he takes this, what could have been a disaster, and turns it into an opportunity to make who he was and what he was about even clearer. But more than that, I like what he says to Peter. Yes, he gives a rebuke to Peter. He says, put your sword away. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. What he is saying to Peter is, Peter, let's get out of your limbic brain into your cortex and think about what you just did. You just got your sword out ready to fight for me. Do you realize that people who live that way, impulsively lashing out in fights, end up being destroyed by that? Those who live by the sword end up dying by the sword. So let's, Peter, get in your cortex and play out that kind of behavior to the end. Do you see what Jesus just did with Peter? He doesn't go into this long tirade of shaming him. He teaches him. He helps him get into his cortex and play the tape to the end. And I'm so glad that Jesus is that way. Because there are times when we do stuff impulsively and we, want, we, we tend to think that God's going to be up there wanting to beat us up and punish us and shame us. And God is really saying, let's get you, figure out how to get you into your cortex before you act not after you act. Let's figure out how to get you to play the tape out to the end before you do something, not afterwards when you actually experience those negative consequences. 
So God understands impulsive people. God loved impulsive people. God works to train and nurture and help impulsive people get past that into a strong, healthy cortex. And so again, Peter is such a human person that we can relate to. And I hope this just encourages you tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Peter's example. That just helps us realize that we all struggle. We all are human with, weak, with weaknesses. And for those of you, those that are struggling with impulsiveness, that just encourage them, get, help them to implement some of the practical tools so that they can grow in this area. Amen. Well, that's the end of our evening. Thank you so much again for being part of it with us. We'll see you next week.